Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of HGSA and Me, a virtual educational series for the HD community. Over the next several weeks, HGSA and Me will offer thought-provoking seminars and interactive sessions that are brought to you by many of our HGSA Center of Excellence team members. Today, we welcome Dr. Ashwini Rao, who will be talking about fall prevention in HD. You can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question, and hit send. Your questions will be answered at the end of the session. This presentation will be available in about a week on HDSA's YouTube channel. On October 15th, the series will delve into the role of palliative care in HD. You can register for these sessions by going to hdsa.org backslash HDSA, HDSA ampersign me. And now a little about our speaker. Dr. Rao is Professor of Rehabilitation and Regenerative Medicine at Columbia University. He's an occupational therapist with doctoral and postdoctoral training in movement science. He has over 25 years of clinical experience in rehabilitation of neurological disorders with a particular focus on Huntington's disease. He has been at the HDSA Center of Excellence at Columbia University since 2001. Dr. Rao's research aims to develop quantitative and clinical methods to examine motor dysfunction in neurodegenerative disorders and to understand motor control mechanisms underlying motor dysfunction in order to design and test novel rehabilitation strategies. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Rao here today. And now I'll turn the broadcast over to Dr. Rao. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the HDSA for um, not only um, hosting this series, but also for inviting me to present uh, at the series. Um, so the title of my presentation is Preventing Falls at Home. Um, and as was just mentioned, I have been with the Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence at uh, Columbia uh, since 2001. Um, this is just a, a slide from the HDSA uh, that the, the information is for, uh, for informational use only. Um, all right, so the objectives of the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few things. First, um, I will address the question, how common are falls in people with Huntington's disease? And then we'll look at what factors uh, lead to falls. And within this, we will look in particular um, to personal factors, for example, like strength and balance, et cetera and then environmental factors. And then for each of the factors, we'll ask, well, what strategies can help prevent falls? And within that, what we'll do is, we'll look at some of the latest research and make recommendations. So how common are falls? Well, for people living at home, the rate of falls ranges from 36 to about 65%. And uh, for people living in a nursing home uh, or any other assisted facility, the fall rates are about 50%. So as you can see, uh, fall rates are fairly high for people with Huntington's disease, either living at home or in an assisted facility. And um, as, as, as you may know, that consequences of falls uh, can be catastrophic. They can lead to injuries. Uh, several people have been hospitalized as a result of falls. Um, so falls uh, can be catastrophic in terms of their consequence. Equally importantly, falls result in a loss of independence in functional activities. And this is particularly important for the person with Huntington's disease and also for the family who are caring uh, for the person. In addition, when a fall happens, the other consequence that often gets unreported is a fear of falls. And for the person who has fallen, fear of falls leads to a reduction in their physical activity. And that is perhaps natural. Um, and most, most people when they experience a fall will reduce their activity in order to be safe. 
while in the short term that's okay in the long term what that does is that the reduction in activity results in increasing the risk factors for falls and in turn increase the overall risk for falls and so our goal as occupational and physical therapists is to kind of stop this negative spiral that results from fear of falls. So what factors lead to falls? Um, at the beginning, I had mentioned two factors, personal and environmental. Within personal factors, we think of overall level of physical activity. We think of aerobic capacity. We think of strength, balance, and gait stability, each of which I will discuss in turn. In terms of the environment, we tend to think of lighting. We, we think of walking surfaces. We think of assessment of hazards and then safety supports. And again, I will discuss each one um, in turn. In terms of the strategies, as I mentioned at the beginning, for both the personal factors and environment factors, I will discuss what the research says and then provide recommendations that are grounded in research. So overall physical activity. Our research and that of others has shown that well before diagnosis within the prodromal phase of Huntington's disease, physical activity is not really affected. However, in people post diagnosis in manifest Huntington's disease, physical activity tends to be reduced. The importance of this is that reduced activity increases the risk of deconditioning. So what are the recommendations for physical activity? We have all seen the food pyramid at some point in our life. Well, there is an activity pyramid very similar to the food pyramid. And so the whole idea is if we look at the pyramid, the activities at the base of this pyramid are activities that we should be engaged in a lot. And these include biking, yard work, household chores, walking. And then the next level of this pyramid are aerobic activities. Um, and typically the recommendation is that we should engage in 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or activity. For example, walking, jogging, swimming, or some kind of sport. The next level in this activity pyramid, it includes strength and flexibility. And we recommend engagement in strength and flexibility at least two times a week. And these may include exercises like yoga, stretching, and strength training. Finally, at the top of the pyramid, is activities that we hope we will all minimize, um, and that is sitting. I realized that in, in the past few months during the pandemic, all of us have been indoors more than outdoors and have been sitting a lot more. And the goal is to minimize the amount of time spent being inactive and slowly increase the time that we spend being active. The second factor um, within the personal factors is aerobic capacity. And aerobic capacity, the research ha ha shows that in people with Huntington's disease, the overall maximum aerobic capacity is lower. And so when performing submaximal exercise, so uh, which could be moderate to high intensity exercise, the oxygen uptake 
tends to be higher in people with Huntington's disease. Well, why is this important? This is important because lower aerobic capacity results in fatigue and reduced endurance. And if aerobic capacity tends to reduce, then routine activities, for example, climbing one or two flights of stairs, becomes more tiresome. In terms of uh, research uh, on the use of aerobic training, we see that training on an exercise bike, I show two examples. This is the upright bike on the left. In the middle is what is called the recumbent bike. Training on an exercise bike over a period of 12 weeks improved overall cardiovascular capacity. And then, Structured breathing exercises, both inspiration and expiration, inspiratory or expiratory exercise, using a simple device like this, um, improves the ability uh, of the lungs to increase their volume. And this has been demonstrated to be important for speech, both the articulation and speech volume, and also for swallowing. So the research seems to say that aerobic training, structured aerobic training, improves overall cardiovascular capacity. So what are the recommendations? Well, we recommend that people choose an exercise that they like. Could be walking, running, cycling, or dancing. And the overall goal of aerobic training is to increase your heart rate when you're exercising. And a good target heart rate is to start with this formula, 220 minus age, and then take 60% of that. And that is a good target rate for uh, heart rate. The goal frequency is about 150 minutes of aerobic exercise of a moderate intensity per week. Now, for people starting out, they may not be able to get to 150 minutes right away, and that's okay. The goal is to gradually increase time of aerobic activity. The third factor that is important in fall risk is muscle strength. And research has shown that in people with Huntington's disease, there is reduction in muscle strength, particularly in the lower limbs. The importance of strength or loss of strength is that this leads to a difficulty in functional tasks, such as standing up from a seated position, climbing stairs, and walking any um, distances. So what does the research say about strength training? Well, resistance training improves muscle strength. And this was done using simple resistance bands and light handheld weights. In addition, functional strength exercises improves the ability to perform activities such as sit to stand and the overall distance of walking. So for example, the activities practiced were included squats and sitting to standing. The goal of strength training is not to end up like this necessarily. The goal is not simply to be able to lift heavy weights, but the goal is to improve strength during functional tasks that we engage in in our everyday life. So in terms of recommendations, some examples of functional strengthening exercises include, from the left, squats, lunges, and in this case, I only have a picture of a forward lunge. 
Uh, we also recommend side to side lunges, which are very good exercises. And then on the right hand side, toe raises and heel raise exercise. These are simple functional exercises that help to improve strength in the lower limb musculature. Other uh, examples of exercise um, that can be done using resistance bands include the chest press, shoulder press, which is an overhead activity, the front raise, the bent rowing activity, biceps curl exercise, and step ups. Now these are simple exercises that can be done with the use of an exercise band. And in our experience, most people um, can do these exercises safely. However, it is always good to have somebody there to supervise and act as a buddy. Additional recommendations include examples for improving core strength. Um, and the three exercises that we often recommend uh, to improve core strength is uh, bridging, uh, as shown on the top left here, plank exercise, as shown on the top right here, and superwoman or superman, which is shown at the bottom here. All these three exercises work on muscles of the trunk, which form the core and are very important. The fourth factor is balance. And our work in the last few years has shown that when we ask people to stand either on a firm surface or on an unstable foam surface, the instability in their posture is greater when they have their eyes closed. And then we also see imbalance during functional tasks, such as reaching beyond our support. The importance of balance is that any loss of balance clearly increases the risk for falls. So in terms of balance training, what does the research say? There are a couple of studies which have focused on balance training. One study um, from Europe showed that supervised balance training helps to improve balance. And then another study from Ohio demonstrated that a simple dance dance revolution videotape based supervised exercise at home helps to improve dynamic balance and also improved walking. So what are the recommendations for balance training? Well, the first and most important uh, recommendation is to begin to work with a physical therapist or occupational therapist. Activities such as yoga, Pilates, Zumba are very important and do incorporate balance training in each of those. Or we recommend balance training with a therapist. Often therapists will recommend beginning with exercises that people can complete and then progress on to harder exercises. So simple exercises that we recommend people do at home include the flamingo stand, uh, shown here on the left, the single limb stance with arm raised, shown in the middle, and towing the line or tandem stance exercises, um, which is standing with one foot in front of the other. Often I tell people to perform these exercises right next to a table or a kitchen counter so that in case there is an instability, they can hold on for support. Gait instability and stability. 
For over a decade, we have known that in people with Huntington's disease, when they walk, their stepping pattern tends to be inconsistent, which means that the time that it takes to complete one step versus the next step is not always the same. The speed of walking tends to be slow and the length of each step tends to be short. And because of an imbalance, people tend to spend more time on both feet. The importance of gait instability is that this reduces overall mobility, which is important in physical activity, and increases the risk for falls. So what does the research say? Well, walking training improves speed of walking, it improves balance while walking, and it improves endurance. And just with balance training, um, the, the most important thing is to connect with a physical or occupational therapist. Some of the activities that we recommend is to walk on different surfaces. And here we see a picture of a person walking on sand. And often people with a backyard, I recommend that they walk in the backyard, then walk on the driveway, because those are very different surfaces. And it's good training for our system to walk on different surfaces. And then as we see in the picture on the left-hand side, walking over obstacles, walking around obstacles is an excellent activity. Forward walking and backward walking are also very good activities as are, is walking at different speeds. And again, uh, we've discussed lunges when we talked about balance training, but lunges also uh, are incorporated into walking training activities. Here's a video. Um, this is a few, couple of years ago, we had the European Huntington's Disease Network meeting uh, in the Netherlands. And some of us got the opportunity to visit this residential facility for people with Huntington disease. And one of the instructors talked about the fact that close to the facility, there are these sand dunes. And they take a group of people with Huntington's disease for an hour every day. <laughs> And the beauty of this is that because they're walking on sand, even if someone experiences a stumble or fall, they tend not to get hurt. And when I was there, I asked them, well, what happens if it's raining or if it's cold? And they responded by saying, well, we wear rain jackets, rain pants, rain boots, and we walk. And, and when we looked at some of the people with Huntington's disease at the center, it became obvious the benefits of doing regular walking in an unstable environment like this, uh, walking on sand. Again, walking on different surface textures is excellent uh, for not only improving walking, but also balance. When we talk about um, walking, often um, my role is to assess uh, and make recommendations for appropriate footwear. And one of the first things I tell people is to not wear flip-flops and to not wear high heels. Flip-flops, while they appear to be very comfortable, they provide no support or the heel. And so while walking, the heel sometimes tends to swim out of the flip-flop, which then becomes an obstacle leading to falls. So when choosing footwear, we recommend uh, looking for shoes that have a firm heel, which has a wide base, the forefoot, which is the front of the foot, 
should be flexible, which means that it should be able to bend easily. Preferably, look for shoes with an ankle support. And if tying shoelaces is becoming a challenge, there are a number of shoes in the market, as shown here, with Velcro straps. And again, look at the sole. It's important to avoid a very thick sole or thick toe grips because that leads to an increased friction which can get caught while walking, which can itself lead to falls. So it's very important to choose appropriate footwear. And if you have any questions, please reach out to your physical or occupational therapist. For people who require assistive devices while walking, the question is, well, which device is the best device? And some of our colleagues um, in Ohio actually did a study about this. And they measured walking while a person was walking on this instrumented carpet. And you can see footsteps, right, left footsteps of this person walking. Now, if you look at this pattern of footsteps, that is what is typically seen. When this person walks with a cane, their footstep pattern changed a lot. So there's the length of their step um, became much shorter, which means that the distance that they walked, it took much longer than without a cane. Same was true of standard walk, a walker without wheels. Again, we see that the footstep pattern changes significantly. The footstep pattern is a little better with a walker with two wheels, but the best pattern of walking, the most regular and stable pattern of walking was seen in the figure below, which is using a four wheeled walker. And so we typically recommend for people who need an assistive device, um, following an assessment with a therapist, we recommend often a four wheeled walker with brakes. And this helps to normalize the walking pattern and improves stability while walking. So, so far we've talked about personal factors, overall physical activity, aerobic exercise, strength, balance, and walking stability, and some recommendations for each. Now we'll talk about environmental factors. And when we think about environmental factors, we think about lighting, surfaces, hazards, and safety supports. In terms of recommendations for lighting, we recommend that all areas within the home or living area is bright and consistent. So we should avoid um, areas of bright and dim lighting. For example, if we walk out uh, from a dark room into sunny outdoors, suddenly our vision changes. The reverse is also true if we are outdoors and we suddenly walk indoors where the light is a little dimmer, suddenly we're not able to see very clearly. And so if we have bright and dim lighting inside the house, people might experience that change in, in visual perception a little bit, which can impair uh, a walking and reduce their stability. So we recommend bright and consistent lighting in all areas. Within the living environment, it is important that surfaces should be level. And if there is uh, any change in surface texture, for example, transition from a wood floor to a carpet, enhance the contrast. And one example of enhancing the contrast is seen at the edge of these steps. There's a white tape that highlights an edge 
in, in evaluating steps, we always look at step height to ensure that step height is consistent. In terms of the living areas, the living room, um, it's important to ensure that there's adequate space to walk in each room. So as much as possible, we recommend placing furniture closer to the wall. It's very important to reduce or eliminate hazards um, as much as possible. So moving coffee tables or side tables from the walking path because they can become obstacles. Moving electrical cords away closer to the wall because you don't want them to be obstacles. Very important, um, the number of times that people report having throw rugs, um, we tell people to remove the throw rugs from the floor. Uh, and this is an important thing because sometimes throw rugs themselves become obstacles. And it's important that we have supportive furniture. In the past few months, because of the pandemic, our clinical service has transitioned to online. And so for the first time now, we're able to, during routine clinical assessment, observe people's natural environment in their home. And often I look at whether this, the furniture that they're sitting on is stable or not. It's important to have stable furniture because sometimes people with Huntington's disease have difficulty controlling the speed at which they're transitioning from a standing to a sitting position. So it seems like they're flinging themselves back into the furniture. It just happens because they have a difficult time controlling the force with which they're sitting down. And this is yet another reason for having supportive furniture. Within the dining areas, we have to ensure that the furniture is stable to support good sitting posture during meal time. It's important to remember to remove distractions from the dining areas because when people are eating and they're watching television, attention is diverted away from eating. And sometimes people report that coughing or choking episodes do happen when people tend to be distracted. Sometimes people uh, need their food to be cut into small pieces if they're having difficulty swallowing large pieces of food. And a general strategy for eating is that we tell people to put the spoon or fork down after each bite to slow down the process of eating. A number of falls unfortunately occur in and around the bathroom. And so uh, when we conduct safety assessments, we often pay particular attention to the bathroom. If needed, we recommend a shower bench, which is shown here. Sometimes uh, people prefer a shower chair, which can easily be placed into the tub and then removed uh, after use. Um, often we recommend, it, along with the shower bench, we recommend use of a handheld shower that is shown here. It's a handheld shower. Sometimes it's easy to have a soap on a string. And in terms of the toilet bowl, it's important to ensure that the toilet bowl is secured to the floor. And this is particularly important for individuals who have an increased amount of chorea movement, particularly in the trunk. As you can see, in this idealized bathroom, there are several safety bars. And so we assess and make recommendations for placement of safety bars in the bathroom, around the toilet seat, at the transition of the bathtub to promote safety within the bathroom. 
in terms of closets and shelves, sometimes, if possible, we ask people to consider removing the door um, and uh, organizing the closet so that all the items that the person needs are within easy reach so that they are not reaching beyond um, their support base and making themselves more unstable in reaching out for objects. So the overall goal in terms of assessment of the environment is to first assess how many hazards there are, minimize hazards as much as possible, and then add supportive structures such as safety bars to improve safety and independence for people at home. Uh, this picture uh, it has a number of safety hazards, throw rugs, electrical cords, objects on the stairs. There's no safety railing on the stairs. There's an animal, so on and so on. And so the goal is for our living areas to not end up looking like this. So the take home message is get connected with a physical or occupational therapist early. Create a structured daily schedule of activities to make physical activity and exercise a habit to ensure that we include elements of aerobic activity, cycling, either a regular cycle or a stationary bicycle, or walking or running, strength training. We talked about functional strength training exercises such as squats. We talked about using resistance band training, balance training exercises, some of which people can do at home with support, but we recommend getting connected with a therapist and gait or walking training. And it's important to assess and modify the environment as much as possible to maximize support and independence. I'd like to thank the HD Center of Excellence uh, at Columbia University. All the team members are listed there. The National Institute of Health, which has supported some of our research, the HDSA, and the Huntington Study Group and the European um, HD Network, which uh, supported the development of physiotherapy clinical guidelines um, that I was part of. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Dr. Rao, that was really a terrific presentation and certainly will be a great resource for our families. We found so often that um, while some may not find the information that you've given today relevant in this moment, you know, six months from now, they'll be looking at this um, presentation uh, for your suggestions and recommendations. While we're waiting for our um, attendees to uh, provide questions, I had a couple for you. Sure. One was, um, what are the signs that um, interventions are needed? So. What should families be looking for in terms of, you know, balance and falls um, in their loved one to suggest that maybe it's time that they get an evaluation of OT? That's a, that's a great question. Um, in general, when people go routinely um, to their um, neurologist for an annual assessment, Often um, I conduct a, a routine assessment of mobility, of balance, of hand function. And I think it's important to get connected with a therapist early on um, for the simple reason that one, we get a sense of what is the baseline level of function, um, which helps us understand where we may need to work on and what things are working already. So we know that uh, several people uh, come to us and, and 
they already exercise quite a lot and they may focus their attention on strength training and not as much on balance training. And so because sometimes people connect with us early and we have a sense of their baseline level of functioning, we can then uh, recommend targeted exercises. In general, I think very early on, it's important, as I said at the end, to have a schedule of activities and ensure that we have a level of physical activity where we're getting at least 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. If people can achieve that, that is fantastic. I know that from experience, those people who engage in, in uh, physical activity and exercise tend to do better. At some point, we hear that, well, I, I'm stumbling a little bit, or I find that I'm running into corners, or I find that walking up a flight of stairs becomes tired. The, the, those are signs that maybe aerobic capacity is limited or balance is limited or that um, walking patterns are becoming a little inconsistent. And when people start saying things like that, it's very important to connect with a therapist at that time. Thank you. Um, so you showed during your presentation um, several uh, graphics, um, particularly in the bathroom, and um, you had grab bars um, in the shower and on the wall. And I know that there are a lot of different kinds of grab bars out there. So can you talk a little bit about what folks should be looking for when they uh, feel it's time for them to, you know, put grab bars in the shower or bathroom area? Right. Uh, again, a very good question. So uh, the, the one thing that we look for, um, grab bars like this are very, very useful. Often um, people tend to use towel holders as grab bars. And for, for people who don't need too much support, that's okay. But towel holders are not meant for bearing any um, weight. And so there are standard safety bars that are uh, essentially nailed in or screwed into the wall and they, they come in different lengths. And so within the shower itself, typically it's, it's a one foot, one and a half foot, two feet length. So at least one safety bar within the shower area and one safety bar just at the transition of the bathtub or shower area is very useful. And that's because often when we're coming out of the shower, we're transitioning from a wet surface to a dry surface. And that's when uh, a lot of falls tend to happen. And so it's important to have a safety bar there. So standard safety bars, it's the location of them that is important. And if there is any questions, please, uh, uh, um, I, I welcome questions and or, or reach out to a local occupational therapist or physical therapist as the case may be. Sometimes uh, people uh, require uh, safety bars right next to the toilet seat if there is space. Um, sometimes people have counters next to the, the toilet, and so that serves as a safety bar. So, which is why conducting a systematic assessment of the space is important for us. And talking about uh, assessing, um, you know, how can a family, um, you really take a look at their space and determine what they need to do for their loved one. Um, you're talking about a lot of different rooms. So the bathroom is, you know, got through that really nicely, but what should they be looking for in terms of their other living spaces? What are the most common mm -hmm. uh, accommodations that need to be made early on that will help a person to really age um, well 
during the progression of HD in their home? Wonderful question. Um, so few things. One, um, to ensure um, that there's adequate space in the living area. And I'll go back here. So to ensure that there's adequate space in the living area so that there's a path for walking without obstacles, that is key. Second, to remove any hazards. So if there are electrical cords in the walking path or there are coffee tables or there are throw rugs is to try and remove those. The third thing is to assess furniture uh, and to ensure that the furniture that we're using is stable. Um, and fourth um, is also we pay attention to footwear. Often people say, okay, I'm not gonna wear flip-flops outside, but I'm so used to wearing flip-flops inside that they continue to use them. And again, as I said, it seems like it's a comfortable uh, piece of footwear, but often it is unstable and it becomes an obstacle that leads to falls. So those are the key things that we um, assess. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, particularly now during the pandemic, we're, we're doing assessments um, using telehealth. And um, I'll give you one example. Uh, one person reported during the assessments that they had fallen in their kitchen uh, while cooking. And so I said, well, what were you doing when you were cooking? And he said, well, I was moving a pot of boiling hot water from the stove to the sink in order to make pasta. And as he turned, he slipped and he fell. Thank goodness he didn't get hurt or burnt, which was uh, uh, lucky. But during the assessment, I said, well, would you take me into your kitchen? Because I need to see the environment and once I saw the environment, I was able to make recommendations so that he didn't have to walk distances with hot water. Or I recommended very simply that if you're transferring a pot of hot water or any liquid, to put a lid on the, the pot and then transfer it so that you don't risk getting burnt. So those are some tips that we are able to uh, um, give people, particularly now that we're using telehealth um, to conduct our routine clinical assessment. And I, I hope we're able to continue using telehealth as an adjunct in the future because it's very valuable um, to us. I'm just gonna ask you that question. If you are um, intending to continue to use telehealth as a, a way to um, kind of look at uh, home accommodations um, in the future. Absolutely. So I, I do think that um, in the future, when we go back to in-person clinics, um, seeing a person face-to-face uh, uh, -face is extremely important. Uh, we gain a lot of uh, information uh, in, in meeting with a person. Um, but the benefits of telehealth are that we get to see people in their natural environment. And we get to see the environment. Um, and the number of times uh, over the last few months where I'm asking a person to do a, a, a walking um, so that I can observe their walking and I notice that they're either wearing flip-flops or that there are throw rugs or um, in, in a couple of cases, I was able to see that there was a electrical cord uh, going across the walking path. Those things we were not able to do previously. And I do think that there is a, a, a lot to be gained for families uh, from once in a while interspersing our visits to a telehealth visit. Um, and, and for our center in particular, we have people who drive an hour, two hours to get to us. 
and it's it's becomes very challenging. And so telehealth has offered us this possibility to have a consistent routine contact with families. That is so true. Um, going back uh, to a couple of slides, you were talking about the study um, with uh, walkers and gait. And um, it occurred to me that not everyone is familiar with the four-wheeled walker. Is that something that's standard when um, a walker is uh, indicated um, available through Medicare or does a special order have to be written? How can folks ensure that they get the best walker they can through their insurance? Um, wonderful question. So uh, typically walkers are approved uh, by Medicare and what we do is we um, provide a prescription and either we tell people to contact uh, one of several vendors directly or go to a surgical supply store um, uh, locally. And uh, what I do is, uh, uh, as and when possible, now I email people a sample, an example of a walker. So I might actually um, have a couple of different options that I send people and say, use one of these, these might work better. In order to be able to prescribe a walker, it's important for us to do um, thorough assessment of a person's walking and balance. So sometimes we have seen that a four-wheel walker is, is perfectly uh, uh, appropriate um, for people. It provides the support that they need. If they need to stop, there's brakes, they can stop and, and put the brakes on. Sometimes people have difficulty in stopping and sometimes families will tell us that, well, once they start walking, they're just flying. And so for people who have that challenge, having a four wheel walker actually helps them to increase their speed more. That's when we recommend a different kind of walker. And the one walker I do recommend is, was designed originally for people with Parkinson's disease. It's called the U-step walker. And the benefit is that it's heavier walker and it is more stable. The second benefit is that the, the resistance on the wheels can be changed. So you can increase the resistance or decrease the resistance as needed. The limitation of that walker is that it's heavy. And so it's not easy to take that into a car and drive. A lot of these standard four wheel walkers, the benefit is that you can fold them and put them in the trunk of a car. So um, to answer your question, yes, four wheel walkers are um, uh, approved um, with a prescription. Sometimes uh, we are asked to write a letter of medical justification, but generally they're approved with a prescription uh, but the important thing is that we need, uh, a therapist needs to do an assessment in order to prescribe the particular type of walker that might work best for each individual. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. Well, I see that we're just about out of time now. I do want to thank our guest today, Dr. Ashwini Rao from HTSA Center of Excellence at Columbia University for this Really, really informative talk. I know I learned a lot. And again, this uh, presentation will be available on HGSA's YouTube channel in about a week. And uh, do remember to join us on October 15th uh, for palliative care in Huntington's disease. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And again, thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you so much. Um, I hope it was helpful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.